first things I think we need in the Caribbean is human capital empowerment, where people actually believe they can do things. Then they need exposure to understand here's what's actually possible and here how these things get built. When you're innovating, ultimately you are starting out expressing your individualism. And then you start finding people who are somewhat like you. It will start with the co-founder, then it will start with, you know, other team members, and then you grow into finding consumers, again, whether business or individuals, that can appreciate what you're trying to do. AI has a role to play in the future of the Caribbean. Everybody wants to tell you about the jobs that are going to disappear. When you drive fear into people, what happens is they get stuck, right? They don't know what to do. What, what is it that I'm supposed to do against this force that I have no control over that you're telling me is going to come for me? As opposed to, why aren't you sharing the playbook? You can tell me everything this thing is going to destroy. Tell me what it's going to build and tell me how I can build on top of it. My strategy is not going into the inner city and pulling a kid out and saying, hey, you're the next Google. My strategy is more so identifying people who have managed to take the bet on themselves. Sometimes coming from the inner city, quite frankly, sometimes, not, not very often, but in some instance coming from pretty well-endowed backgrounds, right? But wanting to do something different and being able to help them shape the outcome. And most importantly, taking a diverse approach to connecting the different parts, primarily people, in delivering that outcome. In today's conversation with Kirk Anthony Hamilton, you learn that your local context matters when doing successful global business from a smaller region. Kirk, a former architectural designer turned entrepreneur, is the founder of Infinity Partnerships, co-founder of Tech Beach Retreat, and the Destination Experience, as well as a general partner in Novamed Health in Jamaica. His platforms have collectively managed over 140 billion US in capital and has seeded over 300 million US in various different sectors. Recognized as one of 75 emerging global entrepreneurs by President Obama in 2015, and he was selected to go to the World Economic Forum in 2016. Most importantly, he seeks to connect local opportunity seekers with global opportunity providers. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you have not attended Tech Beach Retreat, I highly recommend it as an event. There is um, very little places where you can sit on the beach with high net worth investors, movie stars, and talk business and enjoy good conversations. So I hope you enjoy. You're a globally connected entrepreneur. How have you managed to build a global network being from the Caribbean? And then I'll talk a lot more about being a coconut boy. Okay. So being a, being a coconut boy, how have you, how have you done that? Um, so interesting question. Obviously, you know, the, the challenge with these things sometimes is, is reflecting back and, and trying to think, well, how did it actually happen that you're in this position? And I, I don't necessarily think of myself in the same light, but do, do appreciate it. Um, you know, there was a time years ago, like back in 2013, 2014, um, where I was flying around the world like a headless chicken, just trying to tell anybody who would listen of substance about the Caribbean opportunity and what they were missing out on. Right. And, you know, I always say to people, especially when I look at Jamaica's economy, for example, which, you know, over the last decade has, has made some progress, still a lot of challenges, but you know, when, when I started out doing this, my, my product really was just simply, I have a conference, right? Like I'm trying to invite you to the Caribbean to be in an event, right? And initially it was all about getting high net worth people to come to the, to the Caribbean, starting with Jamaica and meet other high net worth people, right? With the thinking that, you know, when, in my mind, when wealth meets wealth, it usually drives opportunity, right? Um, and I do think that's a simple reality. Um, but then I started to realize, you know, what you, what you're really trying to drive here is transformation, right? Um, and ultimately what started to unfold was, a 
was me facing a, a reality that people need to learn, right? From both sides. Like there was a lot of misunderstanding on the global end about what's going on in the Caribbean. And then on the Caribbean end, there's a lot of misunderstanding amongst all our demographics up to the highest level around the global landscape, how to pursue it, you know, et cetera. Um, but in terms of me building the network, <clears throat> um, I guess there was just a, a passion and desire from a long time ago to, to be connected. I always used to think to myself growing up, like as a, as a high school kid, um, you know, I want to be in a position where when I pick up the phone and make a, make a call to somebody, I'm going to get them to move. And so something that would take other people three months, years, maybe they've never achieved it, would take me 20 minutes on a phone call, right? And, and I used to always just think to myself, these families in the Caribbean that, you know, we say control everything, et cetera, um, you know, what is it like to sit in some of these players' shoes in the way that we imagine things work, right? Um, and it would exactly be that, right? If they want, if, if, if a billionaire wants to get something done, they pick up the phone, they make a phone call, and you imagine that the world shifts and, and things just happen, right? Clearly, we know now that that's not necessarily how it goes, but you can get a lot of movement on things more so than others based on influence. So I used to travel all over the place, talking to all of these people, trying to invite them to the Caribbean. And I guess I've built this network through two things. One was persistence and the other was simply execution. The fact that you actually do what you're telling people you're going to do, regardless of whether or not they help you. Um, I think for most onlookers is is something they buy into, right? Because over time, now they're realizing, okay, this guy was serious, right? And he's not just, he's not just a talker, which most entrepreneurs, investors, et cetera, most successful people really don't like talkers, right? They, want, they like doers and they want to know that you're going to do. And it's, you know, entrepreneurs are typically met initially with skepticism, right? Um, even by other entrepreneurs and investors, even though they might be your most likely first adapters or, or first bets in terms of people who will take the risk on you, um, you're still initially met with skepticism when people know nothing about you. They don't know anything about what you're trying to achieve and are you the person to do it, right? So um, that, was, that was a challenging road. And then once you started to build something that people can look at and say, okay, this guy has done this or is doing it, um, I think you, you experience a shift, but that's really how I got started with, with building the network. And then once we started building some credibility, et cetera, now we have names to call and, you know, um, we have a brand and a platform or brands and platforms that we can really just say, Hey, look at who's involved in this. You should be as well. Right. And that's, that's how we've managed to build a community. Um, last little secret to it as well is, um, I had joined something called the Global Shapers Community, mm. which is a part of the World Economic Forum. And, and that really drove a lot of my outlook and my um, connectivity um, in the global landscape, right? And I was able, because of that, to then access a bunch of other communities all over the world where I would always end up being like the only Caribbean person, which has been an inspiration for me, not from the sense of liking the fact that I'm the only Caribbean person, but realizing like there's a need for us to be in more rooms and wanting to create those gateways for people to have that kind of access. You see a real thing there? You see a real thing there? <laughs> a couple, couple things that stuck out to me. Well, I, I call you a coconut boy, so I just wanted to address that particular statement. Uh, to those listening, the term coconut boy refers to the fact that we try to model a lot of what is happening in Silicon Valley. And I, you know, we put Silicon Valley on the pedestal, there's Silicon Alley in New York, there's things that go on in London, and this is how we are taught that business is supposed to run, business is supposed to evolve in this particular manner. And I, I was talking to some 
some trainee friends and, and they were doing, they were going to launch a global startup. So we're talking about today. What are we going to do? Thing, yeah. We're going to talk to these Silicon Valley investors because they have connections out there. I say, listen, fellas, this, this ain't going to work out. Right? <laughs> All is not no, no white boys out there in Silicon Valley. Right? All there are a couple of uh, black fellas in the Caribbean. Um, you all are coconut boys and we are coconut boys. And what that means, it's not the most inclusive term. So I'll, we'll, we'll fix that at some point. But what it means is that we have to recognize that we are coming from this Caribbean region. And there's a perception about us, about how we do business, about how we execute, about what we are capable, capable of both in starting an organization, growing it, exiting it, et cetera, et cetera, that we always have to keep in the back of our mind. We can't just come rule like these other people in these business situations. Um, and oftentimes we only get one shot to make a very good first impression. What's, what are your thoughts on, on some of that? So it's an interesting term to use. Um, I'm not sure I would, I would use the term so much, <laughs> but I'm in total agreement with, with um, the line of thinking and this is what I usually say to people. I feel like oftentimes in the Caribbean, we try to start at the end instead of the beginning, right? Silicon Valley is already at the end. The layers to the ecosystem, et cetera, exist. So there's this myth that goes around about entrepreneurs starting businesses in basements, right? And they started in their mother's house and all this stuff. And, and you know, people buy into this um, story that's, that's not reality, right? These entrepreneurs are Stanford dropouts, right? They're former, you know, Google employees. Back in the day, you know, it would be other companies that, that, that I could mention. And they are, yes, starting on, they're starting small with quote unquote low resources, but they're coming into play with, significant connectivity, right? They have wealthy friends, they have very smart friends, and they have access to a lot of people because of these fertile landscapes that they exist in. So to me, if you're gonna start a an innovative business in the Caribbean, you have to look to playing a role in developing the ecosystem that you need for that business to survive and to thrive, right? So you cannot just be a fintech business, for example. You have to be a platform. And that platform has to do various things that quite frankly, even these in these fertile grounds, you know, people build businesses in this way sometimes, right? You, you have to be able to educate your consumer. You have to be able to educate talent that you're trying to, to, to grab onto. Right. Um, there's a there's a very simple reality. And I'm not saying that. You know. This is the only way to have talent, but. In the Caribbean, we're not a bunch of Harvard. Harvard, Stanford, um, Princeton grads running around trying to build businesses. Right. And while we can create our own version of that, we cannot ignore the reality of if you have a group of people coming from the most polished institutions in the world now coming together to build something, what is your version of the most polished institutions in the world coming together to build? And, and that is what you have to think about in trying to create, right? Um, so, so that's my take, is that people have to look beyond themselves when trying to start these businesses in, in our region and realize that it's not gonna happen overnight and you have to be a net contributor, not extractor. Because that business model, as far as I'm concerned, in our market is dead, right? There's some players who own it and unless you just come with a bunch of resources out of nowhere, you're not gonna be able to um, approach business in that way, right? And, and the new model, as I see it, requires that you are making a strong impact. And I don't mean this as charity, but you're making a strong impact on the surrounding ecosystem that you need in order to grow a business that goes well beyond just, well, here's what I'm trying to sell to you. You know, please buy it. Mm -hmm. 
there has to be that integration with your local partners and everybody at a get a piece of the pie, essentially, right? Exactly. And it can't, we just can't be one dimensional anymore in building businesses, right? And, and again, this is a global thing, right? We are living in a much more multidimensional world, right? When you look at what, you know, I'll give an extreme example, but, you know, some of the things that an underwear company might have to be doing to quote unquote connect the community, right? All they're trying to do is sell women, you know, beautiful garments. But when you look at how they promote themselves and how they're positioning and all this kind of stuff, we're reaching a stage and an evolution in the world where the consumer wants to know that you are improving their life, right? In some way, shape or form. So there was a time where you just bought food, right? Now you have all of these alternatives to the, the traditional foods that we grew up with that are basically saying to you, we are going to make your life better. And that is ultimately what the consumer wants across almost every area that they will buy a product. And that is from, you know, the, the individual consumer at home to the business consumer, right? People want brands that are ultimately able to say, I'm making your life better. And, and more importantly, I heard an anecdote some years ago. We're starting to live in a world where clever marketing is losing out to you know, real solutions. Mm -hmm. So there was a time where you could promote gimmicks, right? You could basically say, we do all of this stuff and your product don't work and, and people didn't have a voice, right? But now they have social media. So with social media, and you, you have to be on social media to promote your product, when you're promoting something that doesn't work, those are the responses you get, if any, right? You basically get, well, I tried it, it don't work. I bought it, it's crap, right? These guys are saying that this thing works in this way. It takes six months before XYZ can happen. Like, all of that is, is now around you, and it's a very different landscape to, to operate in. <laughs> You've built several impactful platforms in the Caribbean, both like I was saying on the investment side, on the tech acceleration side, on the, I think the perspective building side, I think that's very important. Uh, what's, what's the vision that has been driving you to build this out in the Caribbean and um, by an extension Latin America? Um, so I think there are, there are a lot of things that have come together in terms of what the vision is and, and why I have that vision in, in some way. Um, I, I'll try my best to be simple about it, but one major thing is just, I, I, from a young age started developing this perspective that the Caribbean is not participating in matters of global consequence, right? We're just not a part of that conversation. And in order for anybody from our region to be successful, I felt like we need to be, right? Um, how are you calling for investment if you're not a major voice in the dialogue around whatever space it is you're looking to, to um, create value in, right? Um, and so... I would say that is kind of the underlying driving force of why then try to pull people together around these various topics, right? Um, and as I say to people, you know, we, we promote global resources very heavily in terms of my platforms. That's, that's our significant focus, but we're from the Caribbean. So we promote global resources within a local context and one of the major things that I started out trying to achieve or, or kind of narrating was simply this thing that says, look, all I've observed for my entire life is opportunities arise in the Caribbean and they don't get taken advantage of. And when they do get taken advantage of, they get taken advantage of by international investors who we actually promote to to come in and do this thing independent of our people, right? 
So we don't end up participating in the wealth creation at the end of the day. And that is actually our narrative, right? We need to find foreign investors to come and do this thing. And they come and they do it, right? And I felt like in a more global dynamic, as I've observed, you want to have this interaction between local and global, right? Local and international or, you know, New York and Florida, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that dynamic allows people on the ground to be able to rise along with fresh minds that are not jaded by, you know, their long history of lack or whatever else may be keeping back a country or, or an environment, right? And so that's always been my major push is how do you shift from an extraction model to one that is more balanced because the other one doesn't work either if you ask me, right? It doesn't work that you, um, you move to a model where it's just all about local, right? Um, that, that's a very difficult thing to achieve as well, right? We, we need to be in operating in a very global environment where we actually have a voice. Yes. Makes sense. Makes sense. What components do you think are needed to, to have a thriving tech ecosystem in the Caribbean and Latin America? And uh, what, is, what is your definition of a thriving tech ecosystem? Okay. Um, I think, my, I think my definition would simply be, you know, an environment where people are able to build solutions to problems and actually sell them, right? That's, that's when you're thriving, right? You, you can look on at a problem and say, you know, this is worth my time and it's big enough and I'm going to go after it, right? And what I always say to entrepreneurs in our market is, you know, I don't think there are too many bad products, even though I do think you need to think about why are you trying to solve this and is it a big enough problem to solve? But my example usually is this, right? Late night on TV in America, you'll see these ads selling Chia Pets, right? And it's been happening for decades. I don't like Chia Pets. I'll never buy one. But they make millions of dollars selling them, right? And the simple reality is they've built a product that they've managed to find consumers for. I am not that consumer, but they've managed to find people who want to buy that, right? So if tomorrow you decide that you're going to make, you know, ketchup out of sweet potato or something like that, right? At the end of the day, for whatever reason, you think this is a, a solution to something, right? And, and your job then is simply to find a market for it, right? The innovator's dilemma oftentimes is that there's this, there's this kind of um, awkward disconnect initially with, is there a market for what I want to do, right? As opposed to the traditional approach to business is, People are saying they need this thing and I'm, I'm going to fill that solution. In the Caribbean, that's, that, that is our major model, right? You buy and sell. So people know they like macaroni and cheese. I'm going to buy macaroni and cheese in a box and I'm going to sell it to them, right? And then the innovator's dilemma becomes, I think macaroni should be made from breadfruit, right? And I'm going to start manufacturing macaroni from breadfruit and telling the consumer, this is better for you. And here you go, right? Um, so, so I think that's my answer to the first, well, the second part of the question. I'm trying to reflect on um, <clears throat> the, the pieces now to the, to the ecosystem, right? Uh, I think you need a few things. Naturally, you need talent, right? Um, and I spoke earlier about the Harvards and, and such of the world, right? And in my learnings, Mark, um, you know, Harvard and these schools are not about a high level necessarily of just intelligence, right? They're really about a certain level of awareness as to what is happening around you and a certain level of awareness around possibility, right? 
And how do you open those doors and not limit yourself in trying to build something? So these institutions look for the best people in the world and, they, and then they tell the best because it's hard to get in, as you know, right? So they're already finding the best and then telling the best, you are the best. So one of the first things I think we need in the Caribbean is human capital empowerment where people actually believe they can do things. <clears throat> then they need exposure to understand here's what's actually possible and here how these things get built, right? If you think about it, Mark, we, we live in a society where the largest players we know in many, in many instances are centuries old, right? Or at least a century old. Um, Massey and Grace Kennedy have both in, in recent times, you know, celebrated a hundred years on the planet, right? I don't know if we can identify who is the rising Massey, right? So who's next? In other environments, you have, you know, you have JP Morgan, you have Wells Fargo, et cetera. These are legacy institutions. They've been around for a long, long time, right? But we can point to Who's building the next bank, right? When you hear about these, you know, neobanks and fintech platforms, et cetera, you, you start to see the solutions coming, right? We don't have many of these examples in the Caribbean of recent, you know, quote unquote, upstarts, even in the last 20 years, who are contending with the big players, right? And that's where you ultimately want to get to. Um, so beyond the talent piece, you need... Um, you need a landscape that, that has room for disruption, which we definitely do have that, right? Um, you need a consumer that is open to something different. And I think that is one of the areas where we are most challenged, right? We are supremely skeptical, right? Um, I don't think we realize how skeptical we are, despite the desires we express as we look at North America and you know, a lot of our people move into these territories, et cetera. On the ground in our region, we're extremely skeptical. Um, and then we need people to just be able to, to freely move. And I don't mean that solely at like this regional scale with flights being expensive and blah, 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 but even in their own markets, right? Economies are driven on consumption. And in the Caribbean, we don't promote consumption and we don't realize that we, we do a poor job at this, right? When you are in Tampa and you go out on a Sunday and every spot is filled with brunch, people brunching, right? And they're filled. You have to wait in line and this and that and that. That is a thriving economy, right? In the Caribbean, when we see that spot filled, we, we make a problem of it, right? That is for whoever. That is for, you know, like, that's where the rich people go and, and these different comments that, to me, are just, it's people, you know, talking maybe about their reality, but not realizing that that conversation you're having with yourself is, is very limiting, right? Um, the conversation I have with myself is typically one, I'm, I'm not very jealous of people, right? Um, and more so aspirational. Okay, great. They have their jet. One day, hopefully, I'll have mine, right? Um, and also just realizing as well that you don't need to be jealous of everything, right? There are certain things in life that people actually do not want, right? I, I don't necessarily, in my long-term horizon, um, need to have expensive motorcycles, right? Or, or something of that nature. So I don't need to look on it with any kind of malice or anything like that. It's just simply that's something that someone desires. So one of the biggest contributors to all of what I'm saying, Mark, I'm sorry if I went on a little tangent there, is just that people need to be able to operate to some extent within their individuality, right? Because what you're, when you're innovating, ultimately you are, Starting out, expressing your individualism. And then you start 
finding people who are somewhat like you, right? It will start with the co-founder, then it will start with, you know, other team members, and then you grow into finding consumers, again, whether business or individuals, that can appreciate what you're trying to do. But as I said, that skepticism piece, which is, which is global, is highly amplified in my mind in our region, right? And, and that's a layer of a mindset change that we have to figure out how do we start breaking in order for people to really be able to build products from the ground up in our market and then sell them. I, I enjoyed the tangent, by the way. Um, you, you one thing, I, I don't know if it's the, the tone with which we speak that makes our skepticism amplify that much more. And, and so I've, I, I've spent a lot of time, you know, so I live in America, so you, you don't get exposure to the local accents, to a lot of the, I like the word skepticism. I also like the word doubt, um, induced doubt that people sort of inject. And one thing that I wanted to double click on that I learned about all these Silicon Valley uh, places, I work for the top machine learning company in the world. I feel very privileged and blessed to, to be here. And what I've learned um, especially at like, if you visit Stanford, I, I always recommend to anyone to visit these um, sort of pedestal institutions, let's call, sort of call them that, that produce these, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They produce anomalies to some degree. Very, very successful anomalies. Um, and, and you're completely right in the fact that the only difference between them other than highly densely populated area of like-minded um, possibility, unbounded people. And I think that was, that was really the thing that I observed. Like the average person, their level of possibility is beyond anything that I've seen in maybe only 10 people that I've met in the Caribbean. And that's the average mindset of possibility. They're like, what? Oh, we're just going to do this. And there's, there's no roadblocks in their mind, even though roadblocks exist in reality and they go meet those sort of along the way. So I, I appreciate you exposing that or, or reinforcing that. And then I think also calling it out through the mechanism of human capital empowerment. I think that's another domain that I think is very accessible for everyone. Um, and, and it, this leads me very nicely into the next question of fear mongering. Okay. So we're going to get into some fear mongering conversations. Um, so one of your missions is to level the playing field for people at home and at home is, or I imagine all the Caribbean islands, but naturally the ones that um, you're most closely associated with. How do you see AI playing a role in this? So, I think AI presents huge possibilities and, and has a lot of potential. Um, at the end of the day, I always tell people, to me, the embracing of technology, again, just really comes down to making things easier, right? Um, so certainly, I think AI has a role to play in the future of the Caribbean. But I also feel like the, the conversation around AI at a global scale is, again, over-amplified, over-promoted, et cetera, in terms of what it's going to do tomorrow, right? Um, when you look at how a lot of legacy institutions work, right? and all the disconnected systems that exist. Ultimately, despite the, 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 the possibility of automating via AI certain parts, you still have to connect all of these pieces that I think you're still going to have a struggle along the way, notwithstanding all the improvements that are being made, etc. Um, to getting there. So I believe 
there's some spaces in the Caribbean that will be, and Latin America, that will be disrupted by AI over the next few years, right? And few is relative. I mean, I think you know, definitely five years from now and beyond, right? It's not tomorrow. Um, and, and the hope is that we understand the opportunity on the other side, right? Um, and we try to start training our people and, and find training a, a, a tough term, right? I mean, you know, there's, there's having expertise and then there's having soft skills, right? And I think soft skills are going to become more important than your technical, technical ability in any one area <clears throat> um, because of what is happening in AI or with AI and these things, right? Um, so I think in the long term, ultimately, what you want to see happen is that people are placed into better positions in the world um, because of AI, right? So the fear mongering that we're experiencing is that, you know, everybody wants to tell you about the jobs that are going to disappear, right? And when I look out at the landscape and I see how some of these jobs actually function right now, you have to ask yourself, how is AI going to actually come in and replace this? Because, you know, you're talking about one guy in an overarchingly inefficient mechanism, right? But you're saying this job is going to go. But in order for that job to go, all the other pieces have to decide as well that they're willing to work with your new solution, which is technology driven. And while we've seen some significant um, leaps in our global landscape over you know, our lifetimes. I feel like we've also seen a lot of over-promotion of transformation timelines, right? Um, I recall listening to a guy, I think he was from... Google, but either way, from one of these companies, basically saying that there's a cycle that typically happens with these technologies, right? Or, or with these shifts. And that is that initially they're, ex they're extremely overhyped, right? In terms of what they can do in the short term. And then they're underestimated in terms of what they can do in the long term, right? So the real AI conversation that we should be having is... What are we going to see a decade from now, two decades from now, right? I know you did a, an interview with Mark Mobius, right? Who to me is a leader in some of what we're talking about. Um, you know, he said a term to me earlier this year, um, you know, about generative 3D, which is, is like a next step in the evolution. But, you know, Mark talks about AI's impact 20, 30 years from now. Not this dialogue of, oh, tomorrow, all these people and, you know, this company says they're going to be laying off 5 million people. But when you read the fine print of what the article actually says, you know, they're, they're planning to lay off not 5 million, but hundreds of thousands of people for a decade, right? And to me, quite honestly, Mark, that's just a projection. And that is, in many instances, overstating where it might go. and. It's also this positioning that says the only impact this thing is going to have is to remove jobs, right? Because we have this fear-mongering culture where people who are seated in these fertile environments that we've spoken about so far, and we've spoken highly of them, right? And rightfully so, don't realize another simple reality. And it, and it exists in North America. I usually say to people, the way I look at Silicon Valley is it's a place where there are no bad ideas. Everybody is generally supportive, whether or not they're going to give you capital, right? It's a very, like when we say fertile ground, I wish more people could experience what it's like to go around these offices and just have almost anybody you talk to say, that sounds interesting. You know, that's a good idea. I don't know if I can 
like if it benefits me or if I can be a part of it, but that sounds, you know, that sounds interesting. I'd be happy to talk more to you about it. And and they'd likely actually give you, a, you know, half an hour all of their time, even if it's just a brainstorm, right? But the reality that those people also face is that that is a utopia in some instances, right? And we've, I don't want to negate all the problems Silicon Valley itself actually has, right? The Bay Area, you know, social situations, et cetera, that they face. But on the other end of it, Mark, I always say to folks, the problems now come when these edgy ideas try to move beyond the boundaries of utopia. So I saw a problem in, in, in the Bay Area, raise some money, I'm going to build it. Da, 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 da. And then I try to expand it into middle America and start realizing the realities of middle America, right? Nobody asked me for a prepackaged juicer that comes with this packet where the juice is already made and I'm supposed to use this machine and pump it out. I don't know if you remember the story of that company that ended up going bankrupt when, when um, Wall yeah. Street... Is real money the other isn't? Yeah, like four hundred million dollars, and then this article came out basically saying it, it doesn't. Act, the machine actually doesn't do anything, right? And it's interesting to me; these people didn't realize their real product was just whatever it was they were able to put in this packet, right? And if you could have sold that packet, you didn't need the machine, right? Um, but but this is a reality of of markets like Silicon Valley, right? Oftentimes, people are creating solutions that nobody asked for. And their, their unfortunate slash fortunate dilemma is that they're in a market or a place where people will actually fund it because they also exist in that, I guess you'd call it the bubble of, oh, wow, this is interesting. This, you know, th this could work, right? Because I'm a person that has enough disposable income to buy all of these gadgets and fill up my kitchen with all kinds of random little things that do these various various um, tasks for me. But that's not the average person's reality when you start to now try to scale, right? And that is where I think AI will encounter its walls, right? That nobody cares to discuss because we like the hype machine, right? Um, but, but long term, I do think it presents some interesting opportunities. And the, the last thing I'll share for young people in the Caribbean is the legacy organizations that we're talking about in the, in the region that need to be disrupted. And, and we, we need to understand something, right? Disruption does not mean destruction, right? JP Morgan Bank still exists despite all the disruption that has happened in the financial space globally over the years, right? Um, American Airlines still exist, et cetera, et cetera. Boeing company, like all of these massive legacy companies, maybe the best examples I can give are, you know, Toyota, Honda, et cetera, right? These companies still exist. So disruption doesn't mean that you're destroying what somebody else has. And I think it's a, a way of thinking that we need to lose sight of in the region from both ends, right? Because from the legacy institution perspective, what I think happens is you're not able to respect a quote unquote disruptor because you think the conversation is about him coming and taking away what you have, right? If you, if you really think about it, we have very few stories around this, right? We have what we can point to in terms of... Um, Netflix versus Blockbuster. That's one of the greatest stories of disruption actually eating a business away. But that business was complacent, right? That's not your average disruption story. And so then the disruptor also has to let go of this perspective that I'm going to come in and I'm going to destroy institutions. That's not, that's not your job. And quite frankly, you're not going to do it. They're going to crush you if that's how you think you're going you're gonna to do things. The reality that you're trying to actually get to is building something attractive enough that there becomes this layer of interconnectedness where not only can you kind of survive together, but somehow you end up having to intertwine, right? Um, and they're, they're kind of 
shared dynamics, right? That that end up occurring. Um, one example that I can see in the Caribbean, but again, these are two outside companies operating in our region. In Jamaica, and I think in, in many parts of the market, Cable and Wireless owns a lot of the towers that Digicel up, ends up operating on. And that's a story that I don't think we tell enough of, right? In terms of, we see two competitors, but, they're really, but the reality, they're very exactly, integrated, they're yeah. That ultimately have to feed off of each other. Don't matter what their marketing may say about each other, right? They have to feed off of each other. And I don't want to tell a wrong story here in terms of, I'm positive that over the years, what has happened is Digicel has built their own towers and now, you know, the, the, the opposite happens, right? Where cable and wireless shares in their resources, right? Um, so the more I feel like you understand how these collaborations happen and the interconnectedness, et cetera, you, you, you kind of get the sense of, well, what is it that I'm really trying to build? And, and like I said earlier, it's not the destructor. And, and too many people think that, we're, we're having a conversation that's around destroying the way things work as opposed to enhancing them and building better versions of them. Interesting. I, I see something slightly different. I'm, I'm sort of in line with, I think the fair mongering is, is good to, to wake people up, but at least from the perspective of, I think a lot of people operate on the assumption that there'll always be jobs. And that's yeah. been promoted, I think, throughout our entire sort of schooling. Hey, you know, you, you go through X, Y, and Z and, and there'll be a market for you. And I think one thing I'm observing is the, the size of a firm is going to shrink dramatically because of increased productivity with AI acceleration or AI assisted tools. And while that does present a significant opportunity for other businesses to now be on a level playing field with much less um, human capital resources, which I think is actually a beautiful thing because five people could, could go do the job of a 200 person startup now to some degree. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, one of the challenges that I have is that humans have an incredible amount of inertia um, to, to overcome and not everyone is entrepreneurial in that sort of light. So I, I think um, long term, I think it'll be very interesting to, it's going to get very local. I think right now you're seeing global AI and I, I get to see a lot of things inside of NVIDIA and you'll, you'll end up seeing, I think things move a lot more locally. And I, I think for anyone maybe listening who's in the home region, I think you should pr always practice replacing yourself from the perspective, like get in touch with these tools, see what a global AI can do. How, how good can it fill your particular job functions and then start to map out those deltas? Okay. Well, this thing I can't touch. Right. And I like the example you were talking about the, the coconut man on the side of the road, like he's holding up his bottle of coconut water saying, Hey, come buy this. Like there are use cases where okay, now someone is not commercially viable for someone to implement machine learning to solve that problem. Just keep it running the same way it goes. Um, so I think, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how business operates. And I'm excited for people at home to start playing on a global scale. I think that's one thing I wanted to, to make sure I re-highlight in this podcast. Um, I tell folks at home, you are not a Caribbean citizen. You're a global citizen. And it is incumbent upon you to think globally in all of your endeavors, no matter if you're, you know, you're in wherever village or wherever it is, wherever little town you are. Um, and I, I think you, you and Kyle are, are great examples of being global ambassadors, but always remaining, Hey, we from home thing, you know what I mean? And it's, it's good to, to see a lot of that. You guys building that out. No, for sure. And I, I want to be clear, Mark. Um, AI naturally presents some exciting opportunities, right? Um, and it, it presents challenges that we need to face, right? We are not in the Caribbean. So I'm, I was talking from a global perspective. Yes. In the Caribbean, yeah. 
we have not, we have to realize we are not the builders of what is coming. And we're facing an issue where we do not have the skills, not only to build it, but to manage when it comes. So there is a need for us to try to become more prepared, wherein we, we own up to and face this reality that has burdened Caribbean economies for all of our lives, which is that thing, right? We're not the builders oftentimes. So these benchmarks come into our market and they, they kind of take over and we're not the wealth creators or generators because we didn't create it, right? Or we didn't play our part in, in, in what ended up happening, right? Um, but, but I still just want to point to while people prepare for the lives of, you know, their lives in the future, I spoke earlier about soft skills and these different things that you're going to need to have and they're going to play a more important role in some instances and your technical abilities and such like that. Um, while people need to prepare for it, I also feel like there are people who are, who are not coming from our circumstances and other, you know, dynamics from around the world who, when they're building solutions and when they're seeing how it would play out in their fertile market, what they come out with and they have, you know, the, the reality is they get access to global platforms to raise their voice, right? So when they say, oh my God, this thing is crazy, it's going to destroy everything, their message gets amplified to a level that is just crazy. And as you said, people operate with a lot of inertia. So when you drive fear into people, what happens is they get stuck, hmm. right? They don't know what to do. What, what is it that I'm supposed to do against this force that I have no control over that you're telling me is going to come for me? As opposed to, why aren't you sharing the playbook, right? You can tell me everything this thing is going to destroy. Tell me what it's going to build and tell me how I can build on top of it, right? So. That is the thing that I, you know, over the last six months, I feel like I've become very, not just intrigued, but kind of feel like I need to act on behalf of. It's just saying like, look, you, you can't have this one-sided message mm -hmm. that just, you know, quite honestly, there's a lot of ego built into how people like that position that message, right? And NVIDIA to me, the company you work for is the biggest player in AI in the world, as I see it. I don't hear that message coming from NVIDIA, right? Um, I, I actually don't even hear that message coming from Microsoft. So I'm speaking to some very specific personalities out there who feel like in order for them to penetrate the market, and more importantly, in order to feed their ego and sit on their pedestal, the language that they need to speak is, is, this, is the one-sided one that gets a lot of attention that says, you know, this, is, this, this may play out to be really bad and I don't know how to stop it, but I'm the one building it. Right? So, so, so I want to be very clear, right? As a global guy, I'm actually speaking about very specific global personalities who have chosen what I think is a misplaced platform in order to sell their wares. I like that. I like that. Um, I think to, to round out the, the AI discussion, it, it'd be very interesting to see at home what new startups get built leveraging machine learning and also what markets they're able to penetrate given that type of acceleration. And I think one couple of areas of opportunity that, are, that excite me are the, the accent voice technology. So voice technology is typically driven by the North American dialect and accent versus <laughs> there's an amazing diversity of the English language in the Caribbean region and it's it's many variations. I think that's one. And then naturally the Caribbean, I think, has been looked at as an a huge augmentation hub for your company in terms of talent, right? Be it business outsourcing, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a cool opportunity for data labeling as well, because as all of these different systems 
need high quality labels. You need um, affordable people to affordable, intelligent. Oh, yeah, let's okay. Let's let's go around with that word to um, to label this data effectively to train these these systems. So it, it's going to be an interesting couple of years, and I think next year you'll you'll end up seeing um, things take a, a much different direction because now everyone will start having the actual technology and the compute to to retrain this thing. So it, it's going to get um, it's, it's going to be an interesting time. So I wanted to ask you, knowing what you know now, right? You've you've been working at building these these ecosystem building platforms, like as as we were saying, both on connections, investment, um, possibility mindset, most importantly. Knowing what you know now, how would you navigate business differently in the Caribbean or some other less developed region? interesting um that's a tough question mark but okay i guess two, twofold one i probably would have started earlier knowing what i know now right that i've started from before and then two i i would start earlier with um a greater set of understanding of what I'm trying to achieve. So as I told you, when I started, it was wealth to wealth, right? You know, my story, just so you know, Mark, in, in all of this is that when I was in my late 20s, right? Well, in my mid 20s, I brought something global to the to Jamaica, right? This thing called the Global Party. It was a very expensive social gathering that happened around the world in 48 hours, over 300 and something venues in various cities, almost anywhere you can name it. And it had this very high price tag. I had to reduce the price tag in Jamaica. And it came to, came with this key and, you know, it was disruptive, but it also created a lot of, you know, it, it created a lot of noise in Jamaica because people were like, who's this guy and what is this and what is it about? And it was speaking to wealth, right? And here I am as this guy you now trying to come back from overseas. Nobody knows me saying, I have this thing, you should be a part of it, blah, blah, blah. Did it well and was successful. And the next iteration of it was me booking out a place called GoldenEye in Jamaica, which was Ian Fleming's house where he wrote all the James Bond novels, followed by Bob Marley and now owned by Bob Marley's former manager, Chris Blackwell, right? One of the most luxurious resorts in, in Jamaica. And I would say to you, the way I was able to do this was I, I had a US credit card because I used to live in the States. Mm. If I was, if I had come up under the normal circumstances of Jamaica, gone to university, et cetera, and went and got a job, I would never have been able to do what I did because that credit card is actually what allowed me to book this thing, right? And, and they told me I had to book it out and I had to pay up front to book it out and it was a lot of money, right? So I was my, my, my credit card was my angel investor slash venture capitalist. But my vision then, or my, not, not really my vision, but my thought process then was I was trying to connect wealth to wealth, right? And over time, I've realized I'm more so trying to connect wealth to opportunity. And a lot of that opportunity that sometimes, unfortunately, our wealth in the region doesn't see is young people. And when I talk about wealth, Mark, I'm talking about money, right? I'm not talking about you know, moneyed people. I'm talking about just the resource, yes, right? Yes, capital, yeah. Um, and... Yeah, you know, capital and other resources that people can utilize, right? And I think where the vision has gone to that I would start with from day one is the bigger agenda from the get-go, right? We are not trying to create a space for, you know, just wealthy people to connect and do things amongst themselves, we are trying to create an ecosystem and an environment where it's actually the people who don't typically win 
in our market who are then able to win. Now, my strategy is not going into the inner city and pulling a kid out and saying, hey, you're the next Google, right? My strategy is more so identifying people who have managed to take the bet on themselves, sometimes coming from the inner city, quite frankly, sometimes, not, not very often, but in some instance coming from pretty well-endowed backgrounds, right? But wanting to do something different and being able to help them shape the outcome, right? And most importantly, taking a diverse approach to connecting the different parts, primarily people, in delivering that outcome, right? When a, when a quote-unquote rich kid wants to innovate, right, all of a sudden he finds himself or herself trying to connect to the, uh, um, not just an audience, but a, um, a team and a group of people who are not the, the, the group of people they grew up around, right? And all of a sudden, you're trying to break certain social dynamics and, and figure out this other side of the world, just like somebody coming from a poor background, trying to break into rich circles to access whatever they might be trying to access, right? And all of a sudden, you know, you find yourself on a boat on the weekend and, and that, that's just not the life you were ever exposed to, right? And it works in both directions, right? So we try to just work to see where there should be no barrier between these groups. How do you remove the barriers, right? And it's not easy work by any means, but I think we've made some decent pro progress working to do it. Um, are you a reader? I don't read a lot of books. I read a lot of articles. I am trying to practice listening to more books. And I have read some books that have impacted my life, but I'm not the guy that's going to tell you I read a book a week. Right? That's definitely not me. And I have this aversion to books because I actually have a former business partner who, you know, things didn't go well with, who used to read a lot, mm. right? But the thing was I found and, and in hindsight realized in, in all of his reading, he thought he was the people that he was reading about without doing the work that they had done. So you're reading about a um, Richard Branson and he starts saying, you know, well, Richard Branson says da 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 and, and he, I guess it's an, a very extreme version of um, of a personality, right? So not everybody's like this, but I think that just shifted me away from you know, needing to feed off of these bios in order to do what I was doing because you know, the reality when I leave where I am today in Barbados is I'm not Elon Musk and I'm not Warren Buffett as yet and I have to build my own journey and my own version of it and the way he was operating was thinking he was that but then the forces of the world would get applied and it's like yeah you know when Warren Buffett puts money into a company where he is now in life the market shifts and the stock goes up mm -hmm. you put a little money into a company you're not a market mover yet right I, I don't read tons of books, but I've read enough that have been, that, that have been impactful, like a book called Essentialism that I think is like, for me, was life-changing. Um, and then I read a lot, um, you know, I scan a lot of articles, right? So what's happening? You know, what did this person do today? Um, Flipboard and these different resources, Twitter, etc. I scan for um, tidbits on, you know, what's going on around the world. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So my last, my last question to respect your time, what is one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, a college student and someone in their professional career? Interesting. Um, for the high schooler, try to get your hand in everything that you can. Um, expose yourself to multiple career paths and you know, use the internet, etc., cetera, and, and try to explore them. Um, for the college student, um, do what the high schooler is supposed to do, but 
you're going to be likely doing it in a different environment. So realize that, you know, I think that's the part now where you have to start becoming reliable and excellence driven, right? And I think this is a big opportunity overall, Mark. We're living in an era now from millennials down where a significant part of our population is not excellence driven. And we're seeing this decline in service and reliability from, from companies because the people that are to deliver, right, just simply in many instances could care less, right? And I feel like we're living in a world now where it's more, we used to live in a very customer centric world. The customer is the most important. We're now living in a very co company centric world. Well, here's a convenience for me as a company and what you want, it's just not gonna work for us, right? Um, that's a very challenging dilemma to me. But a professional, um, I guess, again, same as a high schooler and, and a college student, um, maybe a, a greater focus on, on being excellence driven. Um, but try to start building something. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter your approach to building it in terms of, you know, I'm not going to tell I'm the first person to tell somebody to quit their job first and foremost, right? When it comes to entrepreneurship, I love telling people, look, and I realize I have to be careful. Leave your job, dedicate yourself to this. Entrepreneurship is great. But in not being that today, I don't think a lot of people spend enough time realizing, one, the beauty that comes in being able to build your dream, hmm. but on the other end, the difficulty that comes with it. And there's a significant amount of value to at least exposing yourself to what it takes to build even before you go and leave a job so that when the time comes, whether you have the luxury of choice in leaving or as you pointed to Mark, where, you know, there are, we are going to see some roles get replaced, et cetera. And you now find yourself in this position of necessity and having to do it that you have a certain set of skills that are required that, you know, the, the example I usually give Mark is when you work for the big corporate entity, a lot of people don't realize that that is what you represent. And the guy on the phone who always picks up the phone and talks to you is not talking to Donovan. He's talking or, or, or Michelle, he's talking to Massey group. He's talking to Republic Bank. He's talking to Goldman Sachs or Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you opt to leave that business, I've seen it happen a million times. You now become Donovan or Michelle and they don't have a clue who you are. Hmm. Right? So, so I would also encourage people to realize that while you build relationships on behalf of your company, you need to also focus on making an impression for yourself that people resonate with you and they remember you and they find value in you, not just the company that you were with. So that when you pick up the phone and you call them, in their minds, they start thinking, Michelle is who used to do X for me. I need to get Michelle to keep doing it. Right? Yeah. Um, and I've seen, if you have that mentality, there, there is that other side, right? Like we have a story within Tech Beach that will be told pretty soon where there's a, there's a young lady who used to work with a very big global tech company. We've seen what has happened with tech companies this year, right? So she's now departed. And one of our startup portfolio companies sucked up that talent, right? And I think it's incredible. But the reality is, she has a lot of personality. So what the person who has now hired her was seeing was not the big company. He was seeing what she was doing in that company and then wanted her. Yeah, um, I know you had to run. So this was, this was good. I uh, appreciate the time. I want, to, I want to do a follow-up with you. I've enjoyed this a lot, Mark, for sure. 
I, I would be very open to doing a follow up with you. I know you wanted to touch on the architecture thing, which um, I think can be a, an interesting story. Yes, um, for sure, and it has been a big part of my life, despite despite the fact that I don't practice architecture. Okay, cool, cool. Well, take it easy, uh, man. Handle later. Amen. All right, bro. Thanks for the time. <laughs>